Okay. It's counting up. One second, two seconds. Yeah, when it gets to about 45 minutes, that's when you want to start looking for yeah. a, a pause to change the tape. Okay. okay? What's, the, what's the minimum? Like, Maximum, you mean? I mean, like... Good afternoon, my name is Andy Salinas. Today is November the 6th, 2010, and I am in Pestreville, Texas, interviewing Raymond Garcia for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, for agreeing to be interviewed for our project. Thank okay. you. Where were you born? I was born in El Campo, Texas, in 1951. And tell me about your childhood. How was your life growing up in El Campo? It was good. Uh, my dad and mom got divorced when I was nine years old. My mom, my mom raised us. There was two boys, two girls. I was going to high school. I was going, no, I was not in high school yet, but I was going to school. And uh, my mother was having a little rough time trying to support all four of us. And as I grew up, I was, uh, I was involved in sports, football, baseball, track, I boxed. Um, when I was a senior, I decided to join the military because I felt that my mother couldn't really s support. I was the only one left but I don't think she could afford to support, a, you know. I wanted to give her some support. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. I wanted to join to serve my country and also to support her, help her support. So did you graduate high school or did you drop out of high school? I dropped out. And tell me about your parents. What did your father and mother do? My father was a salvage man, a junkyard man. He used to go and take iron to Houston and sell, sell parts, parts of iron. And your mother? And she used to be a seamstress. She sewed for about 40 years. And out of the children, were you the oldest, the youngest? The youngest. Okay. Tell me more about elementary school middle school, high school. Did you speak Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? Were you allowed to speak Spanish in El Campo? No. No, you would get grounded if you spoke Spanish. And they would get on you and just want to tear you apart for speaking Spanish. And why was that? Why was that? Because they didn't want you to speak Spanish. Okay. Oh. Well, I, w I would call it discrimination. That's, that's, I was discriminated for speaking my language. And for the most part, El Campo was Hispanics, white people, mixed? It was, but in my time, it was, already, it was still, uh, what do you call it, segregation? Mm -hmm. The blacks used to have their own school, and uh, we used to be with the whites and in, uh, in the same school, but then we got uh, together and there was nothing but fights between blacks and whites and there was a big uh, misunderstanding there for a long time. And before the schools got put together, how was it just Hispanics and white people together in school? Uh, I never had any problems, be honestly, as far as violence. Uh, the only thing, the only problem was uh, the Spanish speaking. That was the only thing that created a problem. When we spoke Spanish, that's when it started the argument with, with anybody, with a teacher, with classmates. They'd call you, you know, a Mexican. I don't mind being called a Mexican, but it depends how you call me a Mexican. And some, some would say it in a real rough way, like, uh, uh, hey, taco, or hey, Mexican, or hey, chili pepper, or, you know, any type of word that would uh, kind of click you mm -hmm. off balance. 
And during your school time, before you dropped out of high school, what was your biggest memory that had an impact in your life? The biggest memory impact in my life? Um, and what aspect do you, do you mean? Just what was the thing you remember most from your entire schooling? That I remember? Mm -hmm. That I always lacked a little bit on, on every subject, even if I studied real hard. I always needed that extra point. I always needed that half point. I always, I never was, I never was good enough. Even if I studied all night long for a test, the, I mean, and just because uh, a letter was mis, miswritten, although it was right, but miswritten, they would knock me off that little point to make that passing grade. Or, in, or you know, not maybe a couple of points. But it was always something. There was always something that never made me, made me believe that I wasn't smart, let's put it that way. You know, uh, and I know that, I, that I, I studied and I knew that what I meant on the test was what I meant for the question that they were giving us. But it was never enough. It was never enough. I was always something short. Do you feel that's like a result of discrimination on the school's part, the teacher's part, or just because you didn't, like, you just missed something along the way? I strongly believe it was because they didn't. They wanted always to put you as a failure. Uh, you know, they always. Uh, it's just like in sports, the same thing. They would never let her, as myself, I did real good. I jumped a couple of leagues because I had a good, a good coach, a coach that was really from another state. And uh, as far as for later on, and when my sons were growing up, they would never let them bat, not even one time. They would never let him in place. They, they wouldn't put him up in a, a mamai. My ex-wife used to be out there arguing, hollering at the coach, to, hey, to please let my son at least just hit the ball one time. And it was just a... Uh, certain people, lawyers, sons, doctors, sons, principal sons, that would, that would be in the first benefit. So when you played sports, was it almost an escape from schooling? In other, I was good. Mm -hmm. So and I was good. So you'd have to be like 100% good to be, to be part of, part of, the, part of the team. And I consider myself I was very good. That's why I consider myself that I was very good in, in school also. But if you didn't pass your grades, they wouldn't let you play ball, right? Mm -hmm. Well, more or less, that's the way it, it is. You know, if you're, you don't make a certain average, they wouldn't let you play. So I struggled, and a lot of times even the coach helped out to let me play. And what position did you play when you played baseball? Pitcher. You were a pitcher? And first base. And catcher. And after you dropped out of high school, did you immediately enlist in the military? Mm, yes, I did. As soon as I turned 18. And after you enlisted, how long did it take for you to leave for basic training? No, like right away, like two weeks. And where did you go for basic training? Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso. Can you tell me about your experience in basic training? Mm -hmm. I trained with the quad 50s. 
No, excuse me. That was my basic. Basic. That was basic. Basic was I was a captain's tra jeep driver, and uh, ah, my mouth is getting dry. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we trained, well, I can't remember exactly that far back, but we trained with the M14 and uh, the M16. But we started with the M14. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did PT every morning, get up in the morning. Um, had to be in at a certain time in the afternoons. In the evenings, we had like police call and certain types of the day to pick up all the cigarette butts or the litter. Mm. And during basic training, were there more Latinos than anyone, or mm. how many Latinos were there? Yes, quite a few. Like uh, I would say, sixty percent. 60% were Latinos. Any, did any of the soldiers you mm -hmm. went to basic with go to war with you? Did you go to Vietnam and were any of those people in your unit? The ones that were in my basic training? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everybody went to, everybody, well, from basic we went to AIT. After AIT is when you get sent off to, to Vietnam. After basic, we went to AIT. That's when we got trained with the quad 50s and the dusters. And go ahead. What is AIT? And that's your training of what you're going to be when you go to wherever you're going. If you're going to be a clerk, are you going to be a, a machine gunner, or are you going to be whatever you're going to be? So. Our AIT training was dusters and quad 50s. And what are quad 50s and dusters? Duster is the tanker that has two 60 millimeter. I don't know if it's 120 millimeter or 60 millimeter. I don't recall a duster that far back. But it's two rounds that fires very rapidly. I can't exactly tell you how many rounds because I was actually more in the quad 50s in my tour in Vietnam. And I know, but the quad 50s are 450 caliber machine guns mounted in a mount, electrically uh, fired from inside a turb. That you can go left, right, up, down, and as a matter of fact, it can swirl all the way around. And it was maintained supposedly for air targets, but since Vietnam didn't have no air targets, we used them for ground targets. And the uh, quad 50 would fire anywhere from 1,800 rounds to 2,100 rounds a minute. And we'd use it mostly to, if the infantry was going to go into a jungle, we'd spray the area with thousands of rounds before they went in. That was one episode. And uh, we used them on fire bases to support the infantry and give support to the infantry and support the fire base with the the they had like 175 millimeters 155 millimeters 105 millimeters that would support the grunts that were out in the field on search and destroy missions and uh, and if we have any incoming MVA or incoming Viet Khan coming into our compound where we'll destroy them. And how did you move the quad quads around? What were they mounted onto? If they were going to be on a fire base that that go mostly on a chopper would bring them down. If they were going to go on a fire ba on a fire base that's up the hill, a, a chopper would set them up out in the, out in the on this place. If it's going to be a flat fire base like uh, Dong Ha, where we were in Dong Ha, Alpha 1, Alpha 2, 
on my lot that would be on back of a deuce and a half truck. And they would be mounted in back of a deuce and a half facing the highway. And what is a deuce and a half truck exactly? Excuse me? What is a deuce and a half truck exactly? It's a two and a half ton truck, I'm sorry. Uh huh. Okay, after AIT and the people you went to training with, how many of those people did you work with in your specific group? Okay, you came, yeah, that question you were asking me. When they read off the list of the people that were going to Vietnam out of AIT, there was everybody, the whole battalion left to Vietnam except one guy that was 17 years old that his mom had signed for him to join the service, but to go to Vietnam, no, they didn't let him go. And there were like, I would say, 10 clerks that were going the opposite way. But everybody else, I don't, let's say 90%, 93%, 93% of everybody that was in basic training, they were reading off just Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam. So from AIT training, where did you go? And what's the road you took to Vietnam? Like how many days did it take? And which is the path you took? When I went to Vietnam, Sorry. they gave us a 30 day leave to come home. And uh, we were supposed to report to Vietnam in January the, the 12th of 1970. And uh, we flew for 24 hours. We landed in Hawaii for fuel and to just really to fuel up, get out and stretch out and get a bite to eat if we wanted to. Although they had some food in the plane, they did have food in the plane, but we got out and get us a hamburger or something different. After that, we got back on and we flew straight to Vietnam. And uh, it was like 10 to 12 hours of, of nothing but uh, ocean. Yep, uh, all you could see is just water for about 12 hours. And before you left to Vietnam, did you, were you married? No. You were single. Mm -hmm. okay. When you got to Vietnam, how, explain the first week to me. What, what happened the first week you did, just got into Vietnam? The first week I la I, we landed, a bus came to pick us up from uh, the airport. From the bus, a cargo plane took us to a cargo plane. A cargo plane is the one that lands uh, the tail to the ground. And then you go in, and they didn't have any seats. Uh, you'd, uh, you'd sit down on the floor, and there's the straps. There's the uh, straps that strap you. And uh, everybody sits down on the floor and, and just grab onto the strap that strings from one end of the wall to the other. And they give you a bag. And a bag is where if you want to throw up, you have your, uh, your bag with you. And that cargo plane takes you to your company, which is Dong Hong. Landed at Dong Hong. And another little bus comes and picks you up and takes you to the company. You land there and it was too late that day, so we didn't, we, uh, we didn't really process in until the following day. And we hadn't, we hadn't been issued our weapons yet. And it was about nine o'clock and we motor rounds started pouring all over the compound. And we were just running left and right, didn't know which way to go. And uh, somebody just told us, hey, just go jump in a, the deuce and a half truck with a quad 50 in it. So we went in there and jumped in the deuce and a half truck and went out to the perimeter and fired, you know, seven, 8,000 rounds and spread the area wherever the, the flashes were coming from. And uh, the round, the incoming stopped. So we still stayed out there for another few hours. As a matter of fact, a couple of them stayed there overnight and the other trucks came in, the other quad 50s were the, in the deuce and a half came back to the company. 
So the percentage stayed on guard and the percentage came to sleep. And what was the name of your company? Uh, 1st and 44th Battalion, G Battery, 65th Artillery. Describe the fire base to me that you worked on predominantly and where you lived in the fire base. I was in fire base Birmingham for about uh, two weeks and it was just a bunker there and a quad 50. And I didn't do that fire base, we got transferred real quick to fire base Bastone that was out there in the Ashall Valley. And the bunker was all covered with sandbags. It was made out of wood and covered all with uh, almost four by fours, four by four woods. And the bunker was covered all through with uh, sandbags, like maybe three, three piled up sandbags on all the way around for support of incoming rounds. And it was just one door in, and just, a little, just enough to set up little bunker beds there. And we had our quad 50 set up right outside. And we always had uh, two people on guard and two people uh, resting. And we were constantly under motor attack. They would come in practically sometimes three or four times in uh, one week, and sometimes more, sometimes every day, three or four times a day. And there were quite a few casualties during those times. The uh, medevac helicopters would come and pick up the dead and uh, not even in body bags. It would take them, take them to hospital, I guess, to be uh, body bagged. And uh, at the same time that fire base that I was in, uh, a few weeks later, I had a, uh, a group of grunts they were right next next door to us, and uh, I would hold their mail for them, and uh, they would go out about three, four weeks, and then come back, and every time they'd come back, I'd be like a, a mailman to them, and hey, Rodriguez, hey, Gonzalez, you know, and uh-oh, you know, mm, smells good, you know, teasing around with them. And uh, one day it was a big stack of mail, man, and these guys didn't come in. And uh, one of the guys came and said, hey, you holding the mail for the squad over here? And I said, yes, I am. And I said, well, they all got ambushed. I said, when was this? And I said, today or yesterday. I don't recall exactly when the ambush was, but it was couple of days in between that and it just broke my heart I mean just thinking of the whole squad getting ambushed you know and after you had seen all the motor rounds all the bodies flying left and right and then you hear this it's a big a big issue that unforgettable and uh, what can you do to get strong you don't get scared you get anger you get like just want to go out there and be vulnerable you wish you were vulnerable and just go out there and destroy all the all the enemy and uh, I stayed there like three months, and then they transferred me to Fubai. And Fubai, it was more like a dusters, where the dusters were. Uh, there was very little quads there because Dong Ha was a quad 50 base. And uh, 
I was in Don Hall. I was in Fubai when I was in process of going to to Don Hall. I was in Fubai before I got to Don Hall, so I stayed in Fubai like uh, six weeks, and we're forever getting sniper fire and AK fire. Very little motor rounds, but a lot of night fire. And uh, we were always in the perimeter firing back, back and forth, back and forth. I even met this guy that was next to me, and, and he was religious, and he wouldn't fire his weapon. And I said, hey, guy, shoot back, shoot back, soldier. And he said, no, I'm not going to shoot back. I said, why not? I said, because the Bible says I shall not kill. And man, you get this, this feeling that you feel like shooting your own comrade, you know what I mean? And which, that would, I, I would never do that, but that's the feeling that you would get. I mean, I mean, you're under attack, under fire, and there's somebody there that's not shooting back, you know, it just kind of upsets you very much. And, uh, after that, uh, six weeks, we went down to, to back to Dong Ha. And I stayed there probably two days and went out to the field. Alpha One, no, let me see. Mylak. <coughs> Mylak was another fire base where. Uh, Mountain yards used to be. I don't know if you've ever heard of mountain yards. <clears throat> They're just a different Indian type tribe of uh, Viet Cong. They were out there in the in the hills, and over there, and on, uh, on all these fire bases, there were all Marines, Green Berets, Special Forces. All these teams uh, were always there because. Uh, there were special teams that would go out into into the jungle, you know, for for like I said, search and destroy missions, and uh, we were there in support of them all the time. And um, we stayed in fire. My luck, we didn't stay very long. I think we stayed there like I don't know what did I say, six, four, or five weeks. And then from there, we went back to Dong Ha, stayed there about overnight, and they sent us to Fire Base Alpha 2. And Fire Base Alpha 2 was another, another bad experience there. We were constantly under attack, under motor attack, because uh, especially in the day. In the day, this is one of the times we were hit like every day for three weeks. They had knocked down one of our radars, and every time the radar, specifically, I don't know exactly what that raised the big radar, maybe for radio, I don't recall exactly what the pinpoints of that radar, how much the capacity of it, so all the, all the, what do you call, the aspects of it. But anyway, every time a helicopter was trying to replace it, uh, we would get under motor attack, and the helicopter would have to leave with that radar right back. And as soon as it'd go leave, boom, 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 again, all over again. And uh, that's uh, one of those pictures that I showed you. There was a direct hit. That was one of, one of the one of the days that it, it hit us. I got some, I think there were some medevac helicopters that uh, they were on that album also. And those were the wounded, the ones that got hit and wounded. And one friend got killed there. And, uh, but I was on top of the guns cleaning them. And he was down there telling me, get down, get down, Garcia, get down. And I said, no, what came to my mind, what came to my mind, I wanted to get in that truck by myself. Cause the other guys were inside the bunker. And I was just by myself at that time. 
you know, just uh, cleaning those 50 calibers. And the only thing, that anger that I already had from all these episodes that I had gone through, I just wanted to get in there in that truck by myself and just go and park that truck on our position and just start firing this, even if I had to get in and out and load them and unload them by myself. You know, because you don't have time to go knock at the door and, and say, hey, you know, you just, you react of what's in your mind right away. You know, like a house, if a house is burning, you know, your kid's in the, in the room, you know, you don't have time to go to your neighbor and, and say, hey, you know, come help me. You're going to react to go in there to tr try to save your kid, right? Well, anyway, the guy that was calling me down, I finally decided to jump down. The motors were flying left and right, and he's the one that got hit. And uh, it's just. We can take a moment if you want. It's. Uh, Let's just take a moment. Let's just. Uh, and, uh, well, anyway, the other guys were, I went to where he was, and I got to him, and by that time the medics were already dragging him away, and I wanted to follow him, stay with him, and the other guys were calling me, Raymond, Raymond, run, run, get back in here, get back in here. And I was like, oh, it's a, so anyway, I crawled to the bunker. They grabbed my hand, pulled me in. And so many things were going through my head. More anger. More anger was going through my head. And, uh, and the motors, stopped again so we go back outside finished my guns and took them right back to where there's to the slot where they're supposed to be but what, like i said when we clean our guns we bring them to the to where they're close to the bunker in case of those situations and it just so happened that it happened and it just pisses you off because you weren't at your location. But that was a routine thing to bring them over here. Um, when we had to change barrels on them or do work on them. And um, finally after that, uh, uh, one of the other guys, they we're all getting short already. I didn't want to go back to the company yet. I think me and another soldier, a team, the guy was in our, in our squad, me and him stayed and uh, got a couple of new crewmen. I took over the squad and uh, well I missed that part on that uh, we had that uh, firefight on the captain that I was telling you about. Let me go back to that. You, you were talking about a situation where you could have gotten a superstar but instead Oh yeah. Your captain got it. Or no, 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 the squad leader. Well, there, were, there was two. That was before, I'm sorry, that was before we were, we was all, it was not the new crew, it was still our crew. That, and that was back early. It was in, I'm probably jumping, I don't can't jump in maybe one episode. Uh, it was around July. There was an Alpha 2 and Alpha 1. And uh, the captain and the lieutenant, A7, A6, and the whole squad, 
the, the quad 50 squat was an alpha one. And the captain called that they were pinned down. They said, we need some help, we need some help. We're pinned down, we're pinned down. And so, like I said, the reaction, we took off. We were on one side of the perimeter. We took off from that side about, let's say about 100 yards, we had to go and put the quad 50 in position towards the, we could, it was about two in the morning, so we could see the flashes. So two people, two people running the quad. I mean, me and uh, Richard, and it was just like, getting to the cans, popping the cans, 100, 100 rounds in every canister, right? And put them in its slot, and jamming it, jacking it, firing it, and then getting another one, popping its can, bloom. By the time you get those two started, the other two had run out. So you had to come back and pop the other one can and go around, put the other can, poop, pop the other can. But by that time, these had run out. So it was just like back and forth thing, over and over and over, back and forth. Even one time we had to get out and let me fire and so we can help each other with popping them cans. We were down to our knees with the shell castings. You know, they were hot, they were oily, we were slipping and sliding of the hotness of them, of the oil that was on them, and just digging under the shells and getting the cans of ammo and popping them again and doing the same thing routine-wise for about 20 minutes. Finally, we saw the two explosions that exploded out where the fire, where the, where the flashes were coming from. And uh, a few minutes after that, the captain called back, cease fire, cease fire, that the uh, motors had stopped. And, uh, and we fired for anything from anywhere from 15 to 18, 20,000 rounds of 50 calibers. In about 20, 25 minutes. And anyway, uh, a week later, they came and gave us, they gave us a, a Army Commendation Medal out in the field. And they gave a ceremony to the squad leader and gave him a silver star. And uh, he was never there. He was uh, in, the, in the bunker. It was their time to get there. They're, we didn't have time to call them. We didn't have, like I said, we don't, you don't have time to go knock and wake them up and you react. You react and we reacted and 18, we were both 18, 19 years old. I mean, the energy was vulnerable. I mean, you just, all you're thinking about is your comrades on that fire base. I mean, your captain, you know, especially your captain, you know what I mean? You, you give it all you got. You give it everything you got. I mean, we sustain burns, cuts, bruises, you know, popping the cans, grabbing the cans with the hot shaling and the castings up to our knees. And I mean, it was, you know, it's, you're, it's, it's quite a firefight. We didn't find out later till the internet, there's an article there that they found six or seven bodies. I don't know how many RPGs. I don't know how many rifles. My, my buddy Richard just got that copy. He got it out of the internet during that firefight. How did you feel that your squad leader got the Silver Star and he wasn't there? Well, I got a letter that I wrote to... Uh, see, at, at that time, Richard, my buddy Richard, he told me a long time ago, come on, let's, let's, you know, let's fight for it. At that time, believe it or not, I didn't, I didn't care about medals. I still 
I, I really still don't. You know, uh, I got him laying, laying in the house, one there, one over here. I don't even have him in, 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 a, in, a, in a box, you know. Uh, I, like I wrote on the letter, I said, I believe that the medals belong to to other heroes, you know what I mean? Like uh, the families are, I, didn't, I never believed in them, let's put it that way. But now that I have grandkids and time has passed, uh, I realize that I, I should have reacted earlier. When I wrote to Ron Paul, a congressman, you know, he, he responded very, like I needed my 201 file and I think I sent off on my 201 file and like my DD 214, it's got only like three medals on there. And 30 years later, when I send off for my medals, then they send me the rest of the medals that belong to me, like uh, four, five more medals. They were never on my DD 214. So that's another part of discrimination that I feel that. They never put uh, anything on our records that was of any value. And then it all came back to my schooling, the way I thought about my schooling, and that uh, they're always knocking off the most important portion of making you feel less valuable. You spoke about another episode where you could have gotten a silver star. No, I, I think uh, what I meant there is that uh, I was telling you uh, another episode before this episode on, on that behalf. How many Latinos were officers in your unit? Were there a lot? None. None? I don't remember any. I don't remember any staff sergeants. I remember one E7. Galantiani, and he was Filipino. I don't remember. Uh, when I was squad leader, I should have. They should have given me acting jack, a sergeant. They didn't. And I asked them. I said, "Hey." I asked the E7. I said, "Hey, uh, hello. Like I'm um, squad leader out there. Uh, don't I get at least some acting jack, uh, acting jack stripes?" I said, well, you know, we, we, uh, you're short and we got some more coming in and we have to put somebody else in your place. And what has that got to do with it? I'm a squad leader right now. I mean, what is, I'm, I'm short, I'm leaving and somebody else is coming in and they have to put him in there. Besides, I had already been there 11 months, 10 months. I, I deserved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. Besides, it's an automatic thing to get acting jack and sergeant as a squad leader. When I got to Germany, when I was leaving Germany with some legal advisors, I told some legal advisors with a story, and they told me if I wanted to stay 30 more days there in Germany that they would, they would give me all that pay, payback I said, no, let me out of here. Cause they would straighten that out. I told them about the situation. I said, oh, we'll get you those stripes and we'll get you all that payback money. And uh, I just wanted to get out. At that time, I was fed up. Then, then you start, like I said, realizing that well, the things that weren't, the things that you felt in your heart that weren't right. Maybe in their heart, I don't know the answer to that. But I know the way I felt for serving my country. Like I said, I asked what I could do for my country, and I served with honor and pride. You were talking about a firebase ripcord and a situation that happened there. Mm-hmm. Could you describe that situation? Okay, 
I didn't go to the Firebase Ripcord, but we were on our way to Firebase Ripcord. That, uh, that was a, there was, supposedly there was like two battalions of NBA around that Firebase in the Ashall Valley. Maybe more, I don't know what I understand. And there was already, they wanted three quad 50s over there. And they had, they took one. The second one was knocked down by the NBA. And at the same time, there was a diesel tanker that was going to be landing over there for the third to go over there and it exploded on top of that base. And that's, I think it destroyed, to my belief, I think it destroyed almost all that base. And uh, they decided to cancel the third quad. For supposedly, what I understand, one of the, the squad leader, the captain, they maneuvered out of there some kind of way the ones that were left and managed to some some kind of way radio in and get support, get out of there. But other than that I I don't I don't know. We got lucky, I guess, you know. That's uh not lucky. I wish I would have gone over there. You know what I mean? I had so much anguish already, you know, that I wouldn't have mind going over there. But uh, they did cancel that uh that third squad, I'm sure where they're going to take us. And we volunteered for that. We volunteered. They were asking for volunteers, and me and Richard and two other comrades volunteered for that. And uh, we were ready to go, even though we had heard that they had knocked down that second. We we're still ready. We didn't change our minds. What made them, I guess, the diesel tank that exploded over there is what made them cancel. But uh, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. What was it like being in behind the quad 50s whenever you moved from firebase to firebase? Did you feel vulnerable? Were you ever attacked while you were moving from base to base? What Describe that. No. We were never attacked moving from base to base. Uh, when you're, like I said, uh, when usually the quad stays where it is, you don't take the quad with you. They transfer you. I mean, they might take me by APC, Armor Personnel Carrier, or by shopper, and they transfer you to the other location. And they, in this situation, when we went to Dong Hall, we went to Dong Hall, and we had our quad 50 in a two, that deuce and a half ton truck. So that one we could drive, there was a flat land over there by the DMZ. Excuse me. So we could drive that, the deuce and a half that, uh, over there and, and park it and drive it uh, back and forth. But then after a little while, they built us that platform that you saw with the infrared light. They, they, they were barely, as a matter of fact, they hadn't even built our bunker yet. See, we were sleeping out in the, in the hooch, a little hooch that didn't even have any sandbags. And there was a motor round right there, a live motor round stuck in the ground that we didn't bother with, sleeping inside that hooch with rats about this big. Yep. And because the bunker wasn't built yet, and we didn't have any place to sleep. And that's why that motor was right there, because the motor, no, no sandbags on top, that, shh, they went right through there. And good thing we never got attacked while we were on that hooch. It was already there when we got there, let's put it that way. Yeah. But when we went into the, got back, and when they finished the platform and our bunker, like, the one you saw with that big pipe that we, and then all sandbagged all the way around, very thick sandbagging. 
And this was an alpha one. The one you saw was an alpha two. The one that's uh, with wood. And yep. And this one was the platform was the support on top of the. It was an around the. Uh, the the big round pipe, aluminum pipe, but it was on top of the. The bunker where it would give us a support, but the, also the quad fifty was right there. And the, that one had a ladder right in the middle of our bunker that would take you right straight to the quad 50. So you didn't have to go outside and go around. It's just right there, take you straight to the quad 50 when we were under attack. You had to do just go, go right straight up. Anyway, you had the two guys already up there and we were under attack. The other two would just fly up there real quick like and help us out. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop this tape and put in a new one because this one's about to finish. Okay. When you got to Vietnam, did you get any training from the military or the United States on how to treat the people or how to react when people from Vietnam were around you? Not to my knowledge. <clears throat> no. While you were there, did you encounter any Vietnamese people? Like, did you interact with Vietnamese people often? I mean, we had, we were in support with the South Vietnamese, they were on our base. Not on every base. The fire base Bastogne was uh, strictly uh, Special Forces, Marine Corps, Green Berets, Army. A big fire base, a very big intelligence base. It's, it's a, it was a quite a base. At all the at the other fire bases where there were Vietnamese, how did U.S. troops interact with Vietnamese people, the Vietnamese troops? I do not remember any encounter, any any type of physical abuse or argument. I don't recall none. Uh, I no. I was going to say that maybe on one occasion I recall that like we're here supporting you guys, you know, maybe once, but n not out of me. I just kind of heard it. So for the most part... Because this, these guys were okay. I mean, they never gave us any trouble. The orphans, what you call them? It's uh, the South Vietnamese, no? South Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. And you were talking earlier about mm -hmm. villages harboring North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, mm -hmm. and like locations cl close to where you were. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you found out a village was was harboring Viet Cong, or how? What like? What were the steps people would take on fire base? Well. I mean, I, I, I never went through that episode, but I do, I do recall one incident where this guy went to a village to I don't know what he went to go do, to be honest with you, but it was during payday, and a little. Vietnamese boy came out with two grenades and told him to give him all his NPC. The NPC was the military payment certificate, right? Uh, that, um, and there was a black man. And uh, he didn't do it. Oh, wait a minute. He did do it. He gave him all his money and came back and took the quad over there that if they did, that little kid didn't come back with his money, that he was gonna shoot up the whole 
the whole village. And what I understand, by that time, the captain from the company and higher authorities found out about it and they went over there and, and told them to back off. They didn't have any business in the village to begin with. So for the most part, you never personally had contact with the villages or people in the villages? I talked to people in the villages, yes. And how were those? Nothing eventful ever happened? Oh, no, they were just, uh, just usual, regular, friend, friendly, friendly people. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, I mean, I didn't have any reason to, mm -hmm. to, to dislike them. And did you learn any Vietnamese while you were over there? Any what? Vietnamese, just how to speak Vietnamese when you were, while you were over there? No. And with the Latinos on your fire base and the people you work with, would you mostly speak English or Spanish? Like, what was the most common form of communication? Well, the uh, communication was was both in English and Spanish. And what did you do? It's mostly mostly English. Be honest with you, mm -hmm. it was mostly mo mostly English. Every now and then, you know, when you get the maybe the whole group of Mexicanos, you talk Mexicano, but overall. It was English because it was always like, it was not a all Hispanic crew. It was always two and two. So it was mostly English and sometimes me and me kind of back and forth, I yeah, would talk Spanish. But I think the higher overall, it was English. And while we were on fire base, what would you do for recreation? What would you do to pass the time most of the time? If, there, if you weren't on patrol or were cleaning your guns, what would you do for fun in between? <laughs> there was no fun. There was no... There was no, nothing. I don't even remember playing cards. I mean, uh, we didn't, no, I, no. So describe a regular day, like a Tuesday mm -hmm. out of your entire time. Describe a regular day in Vietnam, just mm -hmm. one day. We'd be out there sitting, sitting by, by, by the gun. Okay, we, we'd, we'd be sitting by the guns. And okay, on the, on the radio, we had what you call a bullshit freak. Frequency, bullshit frequency. And you'd contact other guys on the other quads and bullshit with them on the radio. And it was not our, it was not our sequence, the, the real sequence. It was a bullshit frequency, that's what you call it. If you wanted just to talk to another, another guy and just chat with him who was in another quad, like telephone, like, telephone type, but uh, as far as recreation, uh, at the company, okay, every 30 days we'd go to the company and have a hot meal, and they did have like a little bar and a pool table. I forgot about that, yeah, but that's in the company. So while you're on a fire base, there was no drinking. You couldn't find alcohol on the fire we, base. Yes, you could go to the village and get uh, alcohol, uh, and they would give us one case of beer per month. And the ice, you'd get it from the village, and did, ice it down. Did you drink often while you were over there? Hmm. Did you drink often while you were over there? Well, you can't do too much with a case of beer a month. Uh, no. No, not, 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 not often. There, we did have a, like I said, a case of beer a month. And some people who didn't want their beer would give it, give it around, give it to us. 
But a uh, case of beer a month is not very much. You could go to the village and buy, they would, they would sell you liquor. Uh, I don't remember about beer. I think they didn't have, did they? I don't know. I don't recall. I don't, I don't recall. I remember some people having liquor. I, I, I never had liquor. I drank a beer, but no, no, no liquor. And whenever you're on Firebase, was there ever like problems between black people and white people, or Latinos and black people, or white people and Latinos? Sometimes, yes. Mm -hmm. Usually blacks and whites, or Latinos and whites, mostly, yeah. Some, some activity. Nah, I can't say. Overall, of all the time that I was there, mm, maybe I saw like four or five in four or five uh, occasions. That are just simple occasions, nothing, nothing shooting or mm -hmm. stabbing or nothing like that. No. And while you were over there, do you write anyone back over here in the states? Do you write letters? Mm-hmm. Who did you write to? My mother, my girlfriend, my sister, my dad. Mm. Oh, my godparents. They got killed while I was there, both of them at the same time, over here in the States. My grandfather died while I was over there. Uh, that's what I would do, right? Most most of the guys, that's what they would do. Like someone would write like every day or every other day. How often did you write letters? Not very often. Uh, maybe once a week. When you were over there, did you know why you were? Did you know why the United States was fighting the war in Vietnam? Did you care? No. No. I felt that I was doing my duty. I felt that I was over there doing, serving my country the way I believed. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. Going back, during the Tet Offensive, where were you? I was in, no, I wasn't over there. It was in 68, 1960. I was back over here. And when you, I understand that. When you heard about it, how did you feel? Did that put you off more to the idea when you enlisted? Or did you want to be a part of something like that? No, I wanted to be in the military way long time ago before the Tet Offensive. Long, right. long right. time ago. Even when I used to see that that little sign of Uncle Sam wants you, you know, remember that that, mm -hmm. that sign? Yeah, I, I felt, I've always felt of serving my country. So that had no effect on your feelings towards Vietnam or going over there to fight the war? Mm -mm. No. And during training or your time in the military, did anyone ever talk about the Malai incident or how that would... Like how to treat villagers after that? I don't remember any kind of schooling or any kind of confrontation on what to say or what not to do or nothing like that. And while you were over there, how did you feel about your captains and the chain of command? Did you think that you were doing the right things or that your captain and the chain of command was giving the right orders? Do you, or do you feel, did you feel frustrated sometimes? that they didn't know what they're doing? I felt that they didn't know what they were doing. Can you tell me why? <clears throat> yeah, because one time I needed a 50 caliber when I was out there in Alpha 1. That's when one of the colonels went out there to 
to see how, see how my guns uh, fired. And I had three that were operated and then whoop. I mean, like, like magic. And, uh, and he told me, he asked me what, what happened to the, uh, to the other 50 caliber. And I told him, I said, well, I've asked the, the staff sergeant already, I don't know how many times that we needed a gun over here. And they haven't brought it. So when he left, the next day, boom, they brought us two 50 calibers. And they told me not to say anything next time. Why'd they tell you not to say anything? <laughs> because they got in trouble. That's what I think. I mean, why? This is our lives. There's, that's our lives in the line. And that extra, this, that extra 50 caliber means a lot. And I had already asked it, requested it. And they kept just uh, putting me off, putting me off. I mean, you were well, there in the, the front lines, and, uh, and they don't give you what you deserve. Mm -hmm. and they, they told me that uh, they brought me the, the guns and said, uh, but next time, don't, don't, tell, don't tell the colonel anything. And I said, well, I told you guys several times. Y'all never brought them. I said, well, uh, but for now, just don't say nothing. We'll get them for you. OK. And that's why I think uh, that, they, that they didn't care, you know. They didn't give it. They never were out there, except that time that the captain was out there uh, during that we had that uh, firefight, that I was surprised that he was back over there visiting with that squad. And uh, other than that, you would never see those guys out there. Once in a blue moon, they were always in back in the base. So when you were a squad leader. How hard was it for you to lead your crew every time you had a situation? What was the hardest part of being a squad leader? There was no hard part about it. I mean, we all knew what we were doing. I didn't have any problems uh, or people trying to tell me this or trying to tell me that. We all knew what we were doing. And uh, all they do, everybody was doing their job. Everybody does their job. Every, everything goes fine. Everything goes well. There were no misunderstandings. There was no, uh, who do you think you are, or nothing like that. It was just a smooth situation. And while you're in Vietnam, what awards, citations, or commendations did you receive? In total, including the ones they gave you after you filed for? I can read them off for you. I can't. I can't I got them in my paper, but I get off of my head. I, uh, I can get the paper. Yeah, I received the uh, Army Commendation Medal and, and the Good Conduct Medal. I received another Army Commendation Medal with the First Oak Leaf Cluster, the Vietnam Service Medal with three Bronze Service Stars, the Marksman Qualification Badge with Rifle Bar, Republic of Vietnam gallant, gallantly, Gallantry Cross with Palm Unit Citation Badge. That's it. How did you feel about the anti-war demonstrations back in the United States? How did I feel about what? The anti-war protests back in the States while you were in Vietnam. Well, I didn't think much about it, to be honest with you. I respected, I respected their, but at that time, like I said, I didn't, I believed that we were there for a purpose. So I didn't understand why the protests, but uh, you know, after I got back, now, when I got, well, when I got back and I, I saw what I saw, then I started 
realizing what it was all about. You know, all the comrades that we lost, 58,000 troops, and uh, little by little it started, you know, well, wow. Then it came back on me, well, these people, you know, actually, you know, knew what, what they were doing. Have you, ever, have you ever been part of an anti-war protest? No. And how do you feel, looking back on it, how do you feel the media portrayed Vietnam and how did that affect the United States image? Well, I'll repeat that. Looking back on it now, the media and the news and how they cover Vietnam, uh -huh. how do you feel that what kind of impact do you feel that had on the war, both here and over there? The way the media portrayed it? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh. I, I really don't know. I get a lot of hatred, you know, because then you start thinking that like, we were made fools out of her and all, all that comes to your head, you know. To so once you came back from Vietnam, you felt like you had been used, your patriotism had been used by the government, almost? Well, not yet. Not, not, not until later on. Then I started feeling portrayed, you know. When I, now that I see the, all these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I see them with no quality impact, you know what I mean? It's uh, like another Vietnam War, you know, losing these soldiers for what? I mean, I, I still don't understand why. I understand kind of why, but why? Should I say? And after you were done with the service, and you came after Vietnam and Germany, and you came mm -hmm. back home, how did people receive you when you came back home? After Terrible. Vietnam? Terrible. First of all, nobody would understand. Nobody would understand me because they hadn't been at war. I had. Uh, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't find a job nowhere, especially in my hometown. I mean, I uh, always, like I said, I always had that the American dream type, you know, serve your country, go work with a post office or be a policeman or a milkman or that, that step by step situation get married, get a family. And for some reason, everything, I lost everything. Let's put it that way. First of all, because Vietnam had a big impact on me. I wasn't the Raymond Garcia that I was. I was a different person. And at the same time, they came and gave me a slap in the face. Not even, thank you. So, everything just started piling up on one thing on top of another. Looking from back and the high school, the, the, the war and the job, the welcome back, no welcome back, no nothing. All that was uh, just a, a big slap in the face. Do you think that the United States took care of its troops during Vietnam? No. Do you think the United States takes care of its veterans now? Way better now. How did they treat them back then? Well, Low pay to begin with, no, uh, 
they would they wouldn't promote you the way they would promote you and uh now you got more say so at that back then you know there was no say so like like uh more like uh you were more pri in prison than in than in the military you know what i mean now you have a lot of more rights more well, I don't know how it is now. I can't. I can't really say. But my son was there, and I can see that he's got. Uh, it looked better on his behalf than on my behalf. That's uh, that's what I can say. It's. Uh, I, I can't. I can't really answer that because I know that we didn't have very many opportunities you to say in our time are very many say so's that we could go up there you'd go up there and want to speak to the captain or to the to the first sergeant and they treat you like a little kid get us out of here don't come in until I tell you to come in you know like you know like like little kids like little like no values. Even in the military, when I came back from Vietnam, that I went to Germany, I was still treated like like a regular one. I mean, like a regular, like a reg one of the one out of the bunch. You know what I mean? Like I'm nobody special. Even if I went to war, you know what I mean? You just, you just, you know, like its own, its own command doesn't give a darn about its own troops. You know what I mean? Was it hard for you when you got back from Vietnam adjusting back to regular life versus military life? Very much. What was hard about it? Uh, well. You were in a, people wouldn't understand you. That was number one thing. People didn't give a damn about you. People didn't uh, care about you. Uh, it changed. You came back a different person, like I said earlier. You come, you come back a different person, man, because you you came back with with a lot of uh, heart broken memories. Let's put it that way. And you're trying to just Let somebody tap you on the shoulder at least, you know what I mean? And they wouldn't give that to you. Nobody would. They, they, they came, well, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. And a lot of people would, you know, hey, you think you're tough because you were over there and, and bullying, you know, like, no, that wasn't the thing. There's no bully to it. There's no toughness to it. The hardness is up here. The toughness is up here. The a different world. It changed from one world to another world. Would you change anything about your Vietnam experience? Would it change anything? No, I don't think I would. I did what I had to do, and I did it proudly, regardless of the circumstances. You talk about your son being in the Marines. How do you feel that? How do you feel about him joining the military? Well, before he joined the military, I told him to let me know, so I could be with him when the recruiter came to talk to him to make sure 
that he got the proper schooling that he he proposed or that he wanted. Not to just let him put him on any on anything they want to put him in and wish what they did. I mean, he graduated from high school. I pushed him into graduating from high school because I didn't want him to make the same mistake that I did. And, uh, but he joined without me being there and he went off and uh, they put him as a, a mechanic, you know. And most of the Latinos that I know of, mechanics or drivers or I mean, something that really had, has some type of value, but no value. You know what I mean? So you feel there's still discrimination in the military? Well, I think so. I mean, I don't see, like you said, I don't see any Captain Mexicanos, Lieutenant Mexicanos, uh, high-ranking official Mexicanos. I don't see them. And if they are, I don't know where they are. I've never seen them. Okay. Did you get married after the war with your girlfriend? Or is it, did you get married to another woman? I got married to another woman. And how many kids do you have together? I had one with my first wife, two with my second wife. And do they know Spanish? Did you teach them Spanish? Was that important? I wanted to teach them Spanish, and I constantly got on them to speak Spanish. And now they speak it a little, but they speak more English. Because now oh, my son is married to a Wolia, and uh, my daughter was married to a Wolia, and uh, it's it's more she they both speak speak a little and they understand it pretty fluently but they don't speak it that well overall how do you feel about your own military participation as a latino like what does it mean to you as a latino to be part of the military i'm proud i'm proud as a latino Anytime I do anything for the government, I feel proud. Like I said, regardless of circumstances, because, uh, you know, serving for your country is completely different of how they treat you. You know what I mean? The feeling, my, my service is very, very proudly served. How they treated me? Well, I disagree with the treatment, but that doesn't make me dislike my, my service. What I did, it was out of my heart. Do you think during Vietnam, it affected Latinos in the war differently than, say, whites or African Americans? Or did everyone experience the same war out there? Uh, it's hard to say. It's it's hard to say because uh, we they the whites have the upper hand. You know what I mean? They they can they can survive with the upper hand. We can't survive because we already have been the underdog. So when we come back, we're still the underdog. So it's going to be tougher for us to survive. You know what I'm more or less? Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's harder for Latinos when they came back than. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because uh, the, the whites can go out to the bank and borrow twenty thousand dollars with no problem. I wanted to borrow three hundred dollars, and they wanted my house for. I don't have a house, but <laughs> they wanted. Uh, Collateral. For, I wanted to go to college, get a $300 loan to go to college. Before, I was going to start getting some my GI bill, right? But meanwhile, while I was waiting, I wanted to start getting in and paying my tuition. And they said that I needed, I don't know what. And even though I had came back, 
I had no credit history, nothing bad, because I didn't have no credit. And uh, my mother had been banking in the bank for forever. And for, then he went loan me $300. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. They got the upper hand. They can live with with hurt, even if they came back a little dismantled. They 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 they, they can survive. But uh, us, if we come back, and they're putting us, give us another step on the ground. That's the way I look at it. Leading into that, do you think TVs and movies and all the movies they made about Vietnam? Do you think that shows an accurate picture of what really Vietnam was? Uh, some. I think the closest movie was uh, Platoon. It's about the closest movie that you're going to get that the actual happening in, in Vietnam. All the rest are just kind of like. I uh, I can't say. I can't say. I, mean, I really can't say. But I I think uh, it's overreacting on some of them. And when, after the war, we came back and you were back here for a couple of years. Did you join any organizations for veterans? Mm hmm. I'm a lifetime member with Disabled American Veterans. I'm a lifetime member with VFW. I'm a member of the GI Forum. I was uh, with the uh, Veterans Organization at University of Houston. I was with all those, well, well, as far as that is concerned. I've always been concerned about my veterans. And like I said, up to now, I still help them get started with their benefits. Because a lot of people, they had their old Korean War veterans, World War II veterans that have no knowledge of the benefits that they're entitled to. And when I got back, as soon as I got back from Vietnam, I was going to the VA since 1972. And I was telling them uh, the problems that I was having. Nah, 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 you'll get over it. You'll be all right. Nah, 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 it's okay. At that time, they didn't, those hospitals didn't give a darn about you. The VA hospital in Houston, they didn't give a, a shoot. I had to write my Senator Benson to get attention. And I finally got a little attention but there was still uh, a big headache going to the VA. And uh, it was a long strive. And there's still sometimes a little headache. Mm. Did you join any Latino movements? Like Social movements? No. No. Mm -mm. I've, I've done everything I do. It's legitimate. It's all a legitimate way. I don't want to get into any radical or any type of... Uh, I come from a good family. My mom raises, but she's a wonderful woman and a lovely woman and I love that woman. She's the sweetest lady, and everybody knows that. And she makes the most sweetest tacos in the world. Well, I mean, food, too. <laughs> yes, sir. What advice would you give Latinos listening to this interview in the future? Excuse me? What advice would you give Latinos in the future listening to this interview? What should Latinos learn from you? What advice can you give them? What should they learn from me? Be cool, stay in school, go to college, 
make something out of yourselves, get a career. And if you want to join and have to join, join and serve and serve proudly. And don't ever give up. Keep going and keep going. Is there anything else you want to say? Anything else we haven't covered that you wanted to add? No. To my knowledge. Well then, thank you very much for this interview. You're welcome. My pleasure.